Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corming Communities, AmTrust, Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Collier's International NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handrow Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., iFunding, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra, CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. It's called Lower Manhattan. It's a place where everybody wants to visit, shop, live, work, dine. And it's growing, and it's growing by leaps and bounds. So today, I've assembled a group of individuals who live, die, and know everything about Lower Manhattan. My guests, they include Marty Berger, who's the CEO of Silverstein Properties. Michael McNaughton, who is the Senior Vice President for Development at Westfield. You know, some small little retail operation, retail owner. Peter, you're giving me your full name. Peter Pulakakos. And you are what? Restaurateur. You own so many restaurants downtown, you don't know anything but that, except for Chelsea. And last but not least, Marcus Rayner, who's the vice chairman at Collier's International. So, you're doing a little construction downtown. I mean, and you are really doing everything in nearly all the aspects I discussed. You got a couple of office buildings that you built recently at the Trade Center. You also have built a luxury... uh, condominium at the Four Seasons uh, with residents and a hotel. And then you own a couple of other buildings over there. You've been in downtown specifically for the last six years with Larry, okay? How do you see the changes? What's going on? Well, in the spirit of the presidential race, uh, let's make downtown great again. (laughs) We're we're spending a lot of time, obviously, focusing on the World Trade Center site uh, because it deserves to have the attention um, it's been 15 years in the remaking, and uh, we're happy to say that uh, all the pieces are in place except for one final tower, which will be two World Trade Center. Uh, but we've, we've built seven. Uh, we opened four. We're under construction with three. Three will open uh, the beginning of 2018. Uh, the Transportation Center is now open with Westfield's fantastic retail project there. The museum's open. Uh, we're uh, about to get underway with the Performing Arts Center, which is going to be called the Perlman. Uh, And then one block away, as you mentioned, we opened the uh, Four Seasons Hotel downtown with the Wolfgang Puck Cut Steakhouse and the 30 Park Place uh, residential condominiums above. So we're uh, very active. In addition to owning a lot of other buildings downtown, we own 120 Broadway, which is two blocks away from this whole complex, and that's a 100-year-old building. So we've hit both ends of the spectrum. And all the buildings are, are doing fabulously well. Um, The vibrancy of downtown is just phenomenal. It's not your father's downtown anymore. 
And I, and I think that's the, the comment. It's no longer your father's downtown. And, and Marcus, we were saying before, it's no longer the low-cost alternative for office market, right? Well, it's, it, it still is a low-cost alternative for, off, for the office market, but the low costs have almost evened out across the, the markets, which means that there are different decisions being made about where to locate. And downtown, you don't just go to downtown now because it's a low cost. You go there for amenity and development. And that's actually um, a trend. It's very important when you think about downtown now and you say it's not your father's downtown to think about what's happened in the last 10 or 15 years. So the population in downtown has doubled in the last, in the last 10 years. It now has as many um, adult educated um, uh, in, in its population as Jersey City, as Brooklyn, which, which basically means you have a vibrant talent base downtown. That's coincided with the growth in the tech industry. And they have found as downtown has uh, improved its infrastructure and provided new development, the new development paves the way for companies who want that talent to locate downtown and provide the sort of environment they want to retain and attract their employees. That's a and huge piece of it because the transportation hub, nowhere else in the world can you access 11 subway lines and two pass stations and be within a 15 minute ride from where all the millennials want to live. It's the talent pool that all these companies want to draw from. Now, if we look back, your dad started in 1958 in that market. Yeah. And you've been involved with that market for how many years? Me personally, since 1999. How much has your HPH operation increased focus over the, since 1999, or really right after 9-11 even? Well, we, we really started after 9-11. We started in uh, our first uh, small pastry shop, 800 square feet, uh, financier on Stone Street. was... Uh, built uh, 2000, um, uh, 2002, December. And then we built our first pub, which started our whole string of uh, nightlife and bars in uh, June of 2003. But I think Stone Street ha has been a major change in the resurrection also. Totally. Okay, Stone Street was part of the beginning over there, you know, of certain of the restaurants in the, uh, but, and today- the, Pedestrian you know, only. You, you know, you're in Brookfield Place on Battery Park City, and then, you know, you're right near the, as we would say, the 800 pound gorilla who has built a fantastic thing about the Oculus. Let's talk about the Oculus and let's talk about the retail at the transportation center. Sure. So uh, Westfield World Trade Center opened August 16th. Uh, we're several weeks into the, uh, to the opportunity. <clears throat> Westfield's journey at the World Trade Center started with Silverstein Properties, actually. Uh, in conjunction with Silverstein in 2001, Westfield and Silverstein arrived at the site in an attempt from the Port Authority to privatize it. Uh, Westfield exited uh, post 9-11 with the opportunity to come back. We worked very closely with the Port Authority over a number of years in the planning, design, and implementation of a viable um, retail destination that would work both for transit riders, office occupants, tourists, and locals. Uh, we are 100% leased. We're in the midst of opening up the balance of our stores with the excitement rolling into Tower 3, as Marty said, uh, mid-18. So uh, we've got some great now, wind Now, within the back. towers, for my audience, tell me where the retail is, because the Oculus is one entity, but... Correct. So the World Trade Center retail program spans from Tower 1 down to Tower 4. It in, uh, fingers out throughout the entire campus with Path Hall or your arrival spot as really the center or the nexus of the project as a whole. So uh, the Oculus, which we know is this wonderful architectural masterpiece coming up from the ground, is essentially what would be considered center court uh, with uh, paths of travel leading to Brookfield Place in the West Concourse and then headed in a southerly direction down under Towers 3 and 4. Unlike the original World Trade Center, this new design incorporates both above grade and below grade retail. So in both Towers 4 and Towers 3, we have three levels of above grade retail in addition to the two levels of below grade retail. So there's the quality and disparity in the retail in terms of different product types so what, attracting what, what, each what, type of what tenant. Is the, the, the retail complex in 3 and 4, okay? Because... Uh, the Oculus has predominantly 
most retail stores as opposed to food. Correct. So given the complexity of the site as what is arguably the most complex mixed-use project in the history of the world, uh, we have limited opportunities to offer food service, such as ventilation, gas, solid fuel, and other types of things that a restaurant, for example, would need to sustain itself. He has a Bunsen burner. <laughs> <laughs> Chemistry we, set. Yeah. We've tried that with the Port Authority. It doesn't work. It doesn't work, right? So um, there are limited opportunities for food. We really see the next frontier for the World Trade Center. In addition to completing uh, our food offerings, such as Eataly and the recently opened Daniel Balud Epicery uh, on the Oculus as Tower 3, as the next frontier for global world-class dining in an above-grade condition with iconic views in what is sure to be one of the finest office buildings in America. And I, I remember I did shows a number of years after 9-11 and other times. People would say, you know, I, I'm going downtown because there were major incentives. Sure. Okay, the incentives were there, you know, they, as a great way to get build up the business. Today, there are still certain incentives, but are, are the people who are looking, and this is for both of you, people who are looking at Hudson Yards, people who are looking at one Vanderbilt, uh, people who are looking on 6th Avenue, are they also looking downtown? They're looking everywhere. They're looking in Brooklyn, they're looking at Hudson Yards, they're looking downtown, they're looking in Midtown South, they're looking in the Meatpacking District. It's What's amazing about New York is that no neighborhood is, is a bad neighborhood anymore. Um, from our perspective, Seven World Trade Center and now Four World Trade Center both have a very diverse group of tenants. So we have your financial tenants, so Moody's is our main tenant in Seven World Trade Center, but we also had advertising, publishing, uh, music tenants, um, not-for-profits, and uh, Four World Trade Center. Similarly, we just uh, signed Zurich uh, for their North American New York office, uh, an insurance company, but we also have Media Math, which is a great advertising firm. Um, Group M, which is a division of WPP, is going to anchor Three World Trade Center with over 750,000 square feet of space. So it's, uh, I'd say maybe 40 to 50 percent of the tenants are TAMI tenants, technology, advertising, media, and information systems. But um, we still have a diverse group of, of other industries that are down there. I think what's what, important is downtown is uh, perhaps the most attractive of all office markets, in my opinion, and certainly from a residential perspective. It is the most accessible via transportation. You have waterway, uh, and it's incredibly walkable given the distance from the connected node of where transit would start on rail. So in a river-to-river -river idea, it's a very close uh, and enjoyable walk. And the opportunity from a rail perspective to get anywhere throughout the five boroughs and beyond is unlike any other part of New York. It really offers an, an amenity package in terms of transportation by foot, rail, water, and otherwise that no other place As can. As I would say in the business, people who go to downtown need to eat. Mm -hmm. So when they're talking about eating, they, they're really talking about your operation. I mean, and you're on all of downtown because you're not limited to be in the, in the financial district. Yeah, we're on the east side and on the west okay, side. You're yep. on the east side and the west side. How do you see the disparity, the, the different type of tenants? Do, do, how do you see the different, do different people come to it or the, do they go to all around? Well, uh, the district, I mean, you also have the, the district the, uh, and Pier A. Pier A is at the southern tip right. of the Bowery. Pier A specifically, which is a very unique project. Pier, Pier A specifically gets... For, for my audience, explain what Pier A is. Pier A is, uh, is a, the only remaining Victorian pier in uh, New York City. It's the, it's the last Victorian pier. It's a structure that's 32,000 square feet. It is two stories. Mo uh, most of it is two stories. There's a head house on the land side. Uh, which is three stories. It's uh, turn of the century. It's uh, absolutely beautiful, completely historic, national landmark. And uh, on the inside, we have created uh, um, three tiers of entertainment. Uh, the lower level is this uh, beautiful like beer garden meets a seafood shack, very opulent, open from one side of the pier to the other. You can walk the promenade, enter inside, come, uh, um, have a drink, and, and, and leave through the other side. It's an uh, open, airy space, a lot of fun, great music, you know, you know, and it's energized kind of all day long. The upstairs is a little bit more upscale. We just opened up, in fact, our, um, our latest uh, addition, which is uh, the Blacktail, which is a Cuban-influenced American cocktail bar. And uh, it's, uh, we just opened it three months ago. It's uh, with our partners from the Dead Rabbit. 
which uh, was just recognized as the uh, uh, in the uh, as number one in the top 50 bars in London, and uh, we were very happy to get that award. It was great for us and great for Lower Manhattan to have uh, an, uh, a bar with uh, with that kind of recognition. So uh, Pier A gets a customer that is very much uh, a tourist and very much a resident. The district gets the trifecta of the office worker, the business person that uh, is in all of their buildings, and uh, a a as well as the people who live in that area, and a huge amount of tourism. Right, what your you could tourism, call visitors. we were talking about this before, the, the weekend tourism yeah. downtown is enormous. It's enormous, and it's different from what it used to be um, mm -hmm. years ago. It, it would be, let, let's get downtown, hit the bowl, go see the uh, Statue of Liberty, maybe, uh, you, you know, walk in the battery and take off. They could spend maybe all of one hour uh, in lower Manhattan. By five o'clock, yeah. everyone was gone. Yeah, everyone right. was gone. And even the tourists, they, they, they didn't stick around. They did their visit and they left. Now, substantial amount of the tourists are actually residing downtown for their four or five day trip. They're staying in the hotels. They're eating in our restaurants and they're eating in the other restaurants. They're eating in everything that they're, uh, uh, that uh, the gentleman here have been developing. And, and, and so it's become a, a real visitor destination, not just a sightseeing destination. So here's a question for Marcus and also for Marty. You know, there's uh, Trinity Church recently announced that they're building a an office building over there. We have the Trade Center buildings. We have the four towers over there. And, you know, even though uh, News Corp didn't move, they were going to have a tenant come soon over there. So the, these properties will be taken care of. How much space is needed in the office market for Lower Manhattan? Can Lower Manhattan absorb another million square feet of space? Well, if, if you think about it, one Vanderbilt, 425 Park, Hudson Yards, Manhattan West, World Trade Center. Other than that, there's no other new buildings that anyone knows about that will be built between now and 2021. If there was, we'd know about it because you can't just build a million plus square foot building overnight. So that's about 13. Sure, little erector sets, you know. <laughs> that's about 13 million square feet, and about half of that's already spoken for. So in the next five years, there's only, call it six or seven million square feet that's going to be delivered to the market in a market of 400 million square feet. So it's less than 2% of the office stock so, that's so being added. So in essence, we've... I think there's a, you've got to put it in context in that the downtown market's 100 million square feet. So when you're adding a million square feet, it's really relatively insignificant. But I think the other more important issue is the, is the type of building that exists downtown. So if you had 100 million square feet of new development, you might say maybe we, we have an issue. What we actually have is uh, an enormous amount of new development and very little Class C space. That's all being converted. So the bottom's been taken out of, out of downtown. And as a measure of health of, of these markets, because that's always an important thing to look at, some people measure the amount of sublease space that's, that's, uh, that's on the market. Sublease space at the moment is 1.3%. Now to put that in context, nice. people start getting nervous when it's over two. They start getting jittery when it's three and panicking when it's 4%. So we are a long way from anywhere that looks as though it's, we're under providing for space. I think the other issue is you talked about a live-work environment. Um, companies that locate downtown need modern buildings in order to support the densification of the workplace. Mm -hmm. And that is a massive movement. You can't do that in old buildings. So when you say, what's the attraction of new buildings? Could, could I absorb another million square feet? The answer is absolutely, because if you build it at the moment, the stock downtown was so poor and Manhattan's general stock of Class A buildings has not been very but high. But one, one also has to be aware, and I, I recently did a show on transit-oriented development, and a lot of it is in New Jersey, and we were talking about the New Jersey is a poacher, as one would say. They, they have had this green growth, these grants, where tenants have an opportunity to go into certain marketplaces and pay really nothing. You know, you, can, you could have gone into Newark and have the tax advantages that you could sell the tax advantages or even in Hoboken, New Jersey City. So you're, you're competing not only with uh, Midtown Manhattan and the Hudson Yards and other properties, you're competing with New Jersey. I don't think that's true. Look, the, the Lafracs have done an amazing job in Newport, right? And if you're a tenant who... Uh, is very cost conscious, you're going to go there. But if, you're, if you want your employee base to be in Manhattan, 
you're going to be in Manhattan. And that's a decision a company makes. A lot of companies are splitting their space. They're putting some of the executive space in Manhattan and some of the back office space in Newport right. or in Brooklyn. Right, which is, which is happening right now. Done that. No, J.P. Morgan Goldman has Sachs has that. Yeah. Right. Goldman Sachs has it. And the third one who's doing it right now is Ernst & Young. Ernst right. & Young is, is moving, relocating a good portion of their, their space from uh, Times Square to uh, to Jersey. Yeah, to, if you uh, look at the ferry service, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of people are coming in from Jersey City to their buildings and our uh, and our French Market uh, Le District uh, through the ferry service. We're we're doing a lot of lunches from New Jersey, and then they just hop on the boat. But what Marcus was saying was the tenants are using space differently than they have ever have before, and and because there's so many more people on the floor. They need modern buildings that, for the elevatoring, for the bathrooms, for the HVAC mm -hmm. uh, capacity. And that only happens in, in a newer building. Right. Downtown Manhattan has the oldest stock of office space in New York. Correct. The first financial that's business. where it was the first location. So as Marcus said, a lot of that space has been converted to hotel or residential. Mm -hmm. uh, other buildings haven't. We happen to own an 85-year-old building and a 100-year-old building downtown. Um, and those but, are, but one of your buildings has specifically been utilized uh, for nonprofits, which has really been a valuable opportunity yes okay because nonprofit companies have difficulties in relocating when <coughs> when the rents are high yes. and one of the great opportunities is the fact that you have as one would say a nonprofit building where people don't have to pay real estate taxes and they're getting certain benefits over. but what's interesting is that building 680,000 square feet and only about 20 percent of the building is is not for profit and we have a huge advertising firm uh, Droga 5 that's our anchor tenant there uh, and a lot of other growing firms there I think one of the things that's often overlooked is the whole issue of incentives, which you just brought up, and why companies take incentives. I think a lot of companies look at incentives. Very few actually make incentives as a means of just cutting costs. They'll have probably made an, an HR decision first, and then the incentives actually support it. And I think that's actually a very important, very important point. You, so the, my, my example, sorry, Michael, would be try and get a tech tent in Midtown South to relocate to New Jersey, to Jersey City. It's not happening. Right, because the workforce doesn't want to be there. Right. Okay? That's, the, mm -hmm. that's the situation. <clears throat> a lot of people believe that uh, Staten Island has a great opportunity because of its proximity, certain parts of Staten Island, proximity to L uh, Lower Manhattan. Do you see a lot of people, would you say, who are residents today coming from Staten Island? I'm, uh, I'm not entirely sure in the restaurants. I do know that um, we, we have a fair amount of employees that live in Staten Island that are traveling over um, and uh, working with us. Um, I'm not sure how many customers would be coming in from uh, directly from Staten now, Island. Now, your restaurants are open seven days a week? Seven days a week, yeah. And hours normally? Yeah, seven days a week. Harry's is, uh, Harry's is the only one that's closed on Sundays. We're open seven days a week. Our pubs are open till 4 o'clock in the morning, 365. Our cocktail bars are open till 2 a.m., you know, uh, seven days a week, some of them till 4 a.m. Uh, uh, on Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. It's, uh, it's different. Our Saturday nights can be, and our Saturday days can be equal to the Thursdays that the financial district was always known for, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely changing. I mean, now, what about Westfields? So we have... Uh at, at the Westfield World Trade Center, we have leases that would allow for 24-hour operation. Um, no one has taken advantage of that yet. We're in early days understanding patterns and traffic densities. Would those be the full services? Correct. Correct. So, for example, that ranges from our longest operating uh, uh, tenant today, which is Italy, <coughs> from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. So they really serve several day parts. Uh, you know, you referenced Staten Island. Um, you know, from a marketing perspective, we view Staten Island, Brooklyn, New Jersey, and the extended areas, given the incredible connectivity of how you access Lower Manhattan, as absolutely part of our trade area and how we would meet the needs for retail uh, services to all of those uh, occupants in the surrounding area, not just Lower Manhattan itself. Now, the old retail at the Trade Center was one of the highest grossing retails in the country. How do, how, what are the projections in the future on the, the Westfield World Trade Center? Well, the, the former World Trade Center had uh, less GLA, uh, which is square footage, uh, in the project itself. So uh, the new World Trade Center 
Westfield's holdings will total 365,000 square feet, which in and of itself is Westfield's smallest project globally, um, but certainly one of the most important and the, one of our largest investments. Um, long term and over time, our rights into Tower 2 uh, will include above grade retail as well. So the project has an opportunity to continue to grow. Let's talk about the transportation, not the transportation center per se, the Fulton train station. Yes. So in addition to our work with the Port Authority, Westfield also secured uh, the retail rights and operating rights for the Fulton Transit Station for a variety of reasons, which include the opportunity to create a connected idea in a transit-oriented uh, theme to move people in and out of lower Manhattan and to provide retail services. Fulton is a bit more of a grab-and-go subway station with smaller spaces ranging from Shake Shack uh, to a, a, a healthy amount of office space, which is leased. These guys are really smart because the MTA actually put that out to bid and we all looked at it and they stepped up and took, so they can control everything from Fulton all the way to the... To I, the I called them the 800-pound gorilla. Right. <laughs> so there is, uh, you know, Westfield is one of the largest operators of transit-oriented retail in the world. We also have a very healthy and successful airports division as well. Silverstein is building right now on West End Avenue. Silverstein is building a variety of properties. Would you build another office building or a residential tower? Would you see the opportunity? You know, it's hard to talk about a generic development. Every development has its own set of variables and its own set of economics. Um, we like to build economically feasible projects, obviously. So uh, the Four Seasons we thought was the best use for that site, which was the former headquarters for Moody's. Our One West End project, which we're selling out very quickly, is a million square foot mixed use project. And we put that together uh, at the time where, when we thought all those uses made sense and they still do today. So we're gonna do very well there. Um, would I build a new office building today in downtown? I would if the incentives were uh, aligned with- And what, what about a uh, residential tower? We are very big fans of residential towers, but it depends on your basis in the land. Are you building condo? Are you building for rent? How high you're going? Is the 420 tax abatement back? There's lots of variables. Restaurant man. I'm always up for another restaurant in Lower Manhattan. I, you I'm, are. I'm big. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm a big. Why fan. are you adverse to leaving the other part of the city? Well, I mean, you know, we. we I, I we, mean, Marcus we said everybody's moving downtown, right? We were, we were, we were there in the tough times. I'm not going to miss the good times. I mean, come on, but uh, it's uh, it's really. Um, I, I tell you, it's a, it's it, it, it's a global development. What, what's happening down there is not just another neighborhood that is sprouting up Let me in put New it York. This way, this how, is like, how surprised are you about how many people are utilizing the restaurants downtown? I mean, I mean, I'm not I'm not as surprised anymore. We were we were we were surprised at how our business was expanding in the evening time and how our business was expanding through the weekends. But I'm not, uh, I'm not as surprised now. You, you have this uh, hybrid of tourism, residential uh, um, uh, tenants, and, uh, and commercial people. It's, uh, it's great. It helps yes. make downtown a 24-7 environment. Absolutely. There, there's no question. And, and I also believe that at one time, people would, would say, I want to be in this portion of downtown or I want to be on Water Street, or I want to mm -hmm. be in, in the Trade Center market. Today, I, I'd say people want to be in all of downtown. Mm -hmm. And the connectivity is there right. to get and from the, the east the, to the west. It's all inclusive Such a walkable it's a, district. It's a, it's, a, it's a walkable community that mm -hmm. you over there. And this is something that, you know, as we said, it's, it was the first office market, okay? It was the first towers. It had all this, and it's just being resurrected. And... The four of you are people involved with this resurrection, and it's wonderful to see. And hopefully in a couple of months or another year, I'll bring you back and we'll discuss uh, where, where it's going on in the future. I'd like awesome. to thank Fantastic. Marty, Great. Thank Mike, you. Look forward Peter, to that. and Marcus, and I'll see you next week. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.